Good morning, space flight enthusiasts. Got news coming at you fast and furious here. Things just seem to be going nonstop in Europe, and most of it moving in the right direction. I'm just going to go ahead and quote this press release directly from Andoya Space. On Thursday, the 22nd of August, Andoya Spaceport received its launch site operator license from the Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Fisheries. Norway is thus taking another important step into the new space age and consolidating Norway's position as the leading space nation in the Arctic. Well, gotta catch up a little bit because Saxevoort got its license a little bit before you did, Andoya, but at the same time, Andoya could argue that they've been launching rockets since 1962 and they'd be right. But we'll continue with the press release. With this license, Andoya Spaceport, located on the island of Andoya in Nordland, has formally become a launch site operator with the overall responsibility for developing, operating, and ensuring safe operations from the newly developed spaceport. The license allows the spaceport to operate the launch site for launch vehicles that places satellites into orbit from Norwegian soil. Quote, there is a huge team effort behind the work to get this license in place. Ever since 2018, our team has been building the foundation that now enables launch of satellites from Norwegian soil. The collaboration with ESAR Aerospace, authorities and stakeholder groups has been key. Building a spaceport from scratch has required patience, creativity, and perseverance, and has demanded varied expertise from many different industries. That's according to Lasse Berg interim president at Andoya Spaceport. And for those of you who wonder who ESAR Aerospace is, well, it's another German launch provider. Very much like RFA in some ways and completely different in others. ESAR Aerospace is also building a rocket designed to take a little over one metric ton into sun-synchronous orbit, but the philosophy behind this rocket is very, very different. ESAR's flagship rocket, called the Spectrum, is similar to RFA-1 in that it's powered by nine Aquila engines that are powered by propane and liquid oxygen, not all that different than what RFA-1 is powered by, with a second stage powered by a single Aquila engine. However, there's no kick stage with this rocket, and therefore its payload capabilities are not quite as good as RFA-1, at least in theory. Also, instead of making use of repurposed off-the-shelf components, these guys are doing everything in-house. They are 3D printing carbon composites, which definitely helps when it comes to mass, and it's very similar to Rocket Lab's philosophy on all of this. However, it increases the cost pretty substantially. Even though the cost per kilogram for Spectrum is substantially lower than the Rocket Lab Electron, we're still looking at $11,700 per kilogram, or obviously $11.7 million per metric ton, which is more than double the price point that RFA-1 has, and also more than double the price point per kilogram that SpaceX's rideshare program has. Not saying that ESAR doesn't have a good business philosophy still, because even at that price point, they still have a really good potential to grab European customers who want a dedicated orbit or just a dedicated mission for their payload and also of course they won't have to ship their payload technicians etc across the Atlantic which reduces cost and reduces carbon footprint all of which is pretty important to European customers. In addition to that the second stage engine is to be equipped with what's called a multi ignition system permitting it to be shut down and re ignited at the launch profile should require such an arrangement, meaning that it can deploy multiple payloads into different orbits, and also that means that, at least in theory, it doesn't require a third kick stage. Although I have to say, I think a third kick stage will make a difference in terms of the types of cargoes that can be deployed, especially to interplanetary destinations or to higher orbits. Still, ESAR seems to have a pretty impressive product 
in the works and they've done a lot of hot fire testing so far on their engines in Sweden, but we still have a long ways to go before this company is going to be at the point that RFA is at right now where they're doing ecstatic fires with a completed booster. But of course, the recent anomaly that took place at Saxavord has now given ESAR Aerospace and Endoya a window of opportunity to become the first spaceport to be host to an orbital vertical launch attempt. However, I still think that Endoya is a little far behind because they haven't even gotten to the point that RFA is at right now. At the same time, though, we definitely have a race. It's not just a race between spaceports. We also have a race between philosophies, with RFA using off-the-shelf repurposed components and ESAR using 3D printed carbon composites. Also, we have to talk about the logistics in place because the nearest port to Andoya is a port called Stokmanes. At least I think this is the closest port where large boosters could be shipped into and it's about 70 or so kilometers away from Andoya. It'd be interesting to see who has the best logistical setup to ship boosters from Germany up to their respective spaceports. But very interesting to see two German launch providers running neck and neck right now to accomplish something that nobody up to this point has accomplished in Western Europe. I'll keep you up to date on everything that's going on. Thank you very much for watching. I would like to thank Raymond and Pastado and John Maruzzi. I may have mispronounced your names. I apologize for that, but for your generous support in getting me to Cape Canaveral to cover the upcoming Crew-9 launch with NASA and SpaceX. Really excited to bring you all all those details and if you'd like to join these folks all the details are in the description please don't forget to like and subscribe and as always stay angry about space